what is my supplement philosophy? And again, my philosophy, I think, is to be relatively conservative, certainly at least compared to some of the people out there in the, the biohacking community. Um, so again, my number one is supplement to deficiencies. Vitamins are a good example. If you're deficient, fix the deficiency. This is no brainer, right? Measure, intervene, measure again. So uh, I can just give you an example from the data in our Optispan cohorts, about probably 75% of the people who have come through one of our programs so far are deficient in either vitamin D, vitamin B12, or omega-3, and often all three of those. So I think these are really three good examples where you can measure the deficiency, it's trivially easy to supplement to fix the deficiency, and then you can measure again and make sure you fix the deficiency. So that to me seems like it's got a really solid um, risk reward ratio. Um, I think in general though, you always wanna question why you think something will work. If you're considering adding a supplement to your stack, really internally do a little bit of self-evaluation and ask yourself, why do I believe this is going to help? Um, okay, so here's what I'm currently taking. Uh, daily vitamin D, vitamin B12, and omega-3. So I was in that 75 to 80% that was actually deficient in all three. And I was woefully, woefully deficient in vitamin D. When I first learned this a couple of years ago, I was pretty shocked and realized, again, I'm, I've lived in sort of the Seattle area for much of my life. I've probably been deficient in vitamin D for much of my life. Um, and I was actually kind of pissed off that this had never been detected before because we never measure it in primary care. Um, so those are the three uh, vitamin deficiencies that I supplement daily. I know they work because I've measured them. Um, I uh, supplement with uh, protein in a protein shake. So I have a protein shake as my sort of morning meal, uh, so to speak. That seems to work really well for me. I also add to the protein shake uh, collagen. Collagen is pretty interesting, and I was pretty skeptical about collagen. And this actually came about from a conversation that Brad Stanfield and I had um, probably a year or two ago now that really made me take a closer look at the literature on collagen. I still don't get the biological mechanism there, but the data seemed pretty compelling that a collagen supplementation has some benefits. And so I add collagen to the shake along with the protein powder. Collagen, of course, is another source of protein. So that, that works um, pretty well in the context of my protein shake. And then I've also started taking some prebiotics that I also add to the shake, particularly um, chia seeds and inulin powder. Um, so those also uh, are, I think, good sources to supplement fiber. I, you know, I know some people are skeptical of prebiotic supplementation. I tend to agree with the folks who suggest that supplementing with with a fiber on top of an unhealthy diet probably isn't going to have a huge impact. Although there's literature out there that again, I, I think is reasonably good showing some modest benefits from probiotic supplementation, even on top of a, what I would consider a relatively unhealthy diet. But I certainly wouldn't want to suggest that you should supplement with prebiotics in place of dietary fiber. Um, and then I take uh, creatine powder every day. Again, I'm not 100% positive that this has had a significant impact on me, but you know, many, many people who know more than I do about muscle biology swear by it. Uh, and I do think it has helped me uh, increase my lean mass at the same time that I lost fat mass. Uh, so, um, so I continue to take creatine. Again, I think there's very little downside to any of these things. So I feel pretty comfortable uh, having these as kind of the core of my uh, supplement stacks. Every once in a while, I've taken Athletic Greens. I'm, I'm actually not really doing that anymore. I think Athletic Greens is essentially just a multivitamin that has been marketed really, really well, but it's a good multivitamin. Um, I've started taking magnesium. Peter Atia had a pretty good episode on that recently. One of the challenges here is it's hard to really measure a deficiency. But again, I think the downside to a magnesium supplement really very little. Okay. And then rapamycin. So I mentioned that I would come back to rapamycin. I also mentioned that I don't really think about um, prescription medications as any different than uh, over-the-counter supplements in, in terms of the way they work. Uh, I think of rapamycin in this case as a supplement because I'm not taking it for a given 
chronic disease. So uh, if you've watched other episodes on this channel and the R files, you will have learned that I cycle rapamycin periodically. I'm honestly not all that scientific about the way that I approach it, but usually these are 12 week cycles with six months to a year off between cycles. Um, and I think this is the one thing where, you know, people can reasonably question my risk reward analysis. I think people can honestly disagree about where the risk reward falls for something like rapamycin. I get it. I don't recommend other people take rapamycin, but I'm personally comfortable with my own protocol. And I would say I have taken a, what I think is a pretty rational approach to my own risk reward analysis. And, and so that's where I'm at with rapamycin. <laughs>